Well, hi everyone. Tim here again uh, with lecture nine of physics 3113, thermal physics and statistical mechanics. Um, and in this lecture, we will be continuing our discussion of the ideal Fermi gas that we began in lecture eight. Uh, by the way, sometimes you'll hear uh, the zero temperature ideal Fermi gas referred to as the degenerate Fermi gas. And that's at zero temperature when everything's down in the lowest energy levels. Um, okay, so in this lecture, we'll, I'll first have a recap of the last lecture. Just a couple things we found in the last lecture we'll, we'll, I'll mention again. And then um, we'll tr start to think about what happens at non-zero temperature. And so we'll, first we'll go over a couple of approximate um, estimations of the heat capacity and the magnetic susceptibility at non-zero finite small temperature and we'll use some physical arguments to motivate uh, and get a, uh, an estimate of what those should be and how they should depend uh, and even that's a crude estimate we'll see that they actually this actually works quite well and then we'll move on to actually calculate these things um, and to calculate the uh, heat capacity of course at non-zero temperature we'll have to calculate the mean energy at non-zero temperature and I'll show you how that works for the Sommerfeld expansion. Um, Sommerfeld expansion is not actually on the syllabus, but I've included some detailed notes on the Sommerfeld expansion. But um, in this lecture, I'll just we'll just use the result of the Sommerfeld expansion to show what you get for energy and heat capacity um, at non-zero temperature. Uh, and then we'll discuss Pauli paramagnetism. That's the paramagnetism of um, free fermions, as we have in our sort of ideal Fermi gas model of, um, of uh, a metal and we'll actually calculate the magnetic susceptibility for that and then finally we'll wind up with the pressure of the ideal Fermi gas. Okay so in the last lecture uh, we discussed the situation with n fermions at t equals zero and we argued that we due to Fermi statistics we had to have the n lowest energy states field, filled so we have some system like particles in a box and we start putting on in fermions and we start with the lowest energy and we fill that up to some level. Uh, the energy level we get after we put large n fermions there is the Fermi level. Now, a, a couple lectures ago we derived the sort of Fermi direct distribution function at it, as it's called, which is the mean occupancy of um, a level of energy epsilon depending on the chemical potential mu and we found it had this form and if we really want this to describe our system of l large n number of fermions we would we need to have that equal one for every energy below the Fermi energy so it's definitely occupied at t equals zero and it has to be zero above that and if you look at this function with the, which is a step function in the limit that temperature goes to zero this becomes the step function um, when epsilon equals mu and so it's very clear that the chemical potential at zero temperature has to be the Fermi energy for this to, 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 to match this, this constraint on number of particles, right? Let's see how that works. So at t equals zero, we have this equation for the total number of particles in. It's just the integral from zero to infinity of the density of states that we derived times the mean occupancy. So this is the number this is the mean number of uh, fermions in the energy range epsilon to epsilon plus delta epsilon. Now at zero temperature this integral is quite easy to, to is, it's much more simple of course because this functions one for energies below the Fermi energy and zero above so that that cut that means that cuts this integral off at the Fermi energy and it just gives us one uh, for the factor this factor n bar all the way up to the Fermi energy and that allows us to calculate the Fermi energy, we just do this integral using the density of states that we derived that includes the spin here, and uh, we get this number, and then of course we solve that uh, for the Fermi energy, and we get the Fermi energy in this form. It's h squared over 2m uh, times this quantity to the two-thirds th two power. So we see that the Fermi energy depends upon inversely on the fermion mass and on the, this number density, the number per unit volume to the two-thirds power. And I mentioned also for metals, the Fermi energy turns out to be a few electron volts, 
uh, which is in, in units of KBT or in units of temperature, uh, that would be tens of thousands of kelvins. So it's very high. Um, so, for example, for silver, I think it's like 65,000 kelvin. It's the Fermi temperature, if you want to call it Fermi temperature. And of course, that means, you know, we're always sort of in the low temperature limit because, I mean, most metals melt at 1,000 kelvin anyway. So, um, of course, I, I guess it's still metallic if it's at that temperature. But most things we see, most at room temperature, the point is um, even above room temperature, we're always in this limit of low temperature with respect to the Fermi temperature. And that's good for us because it makes it able, it's, that means we can calculate things. So, uh, we also so, so I'll show, we also showed that um, in lecture eight that for additional calculations, once we have the Fermi energy here uh, through this uh, constraint and, and integral, then it's really really useful for other calculations. Believe me, once you do this a while, you'll realize this make will make your life a lot easier. That is to write the density of states. Um, in terms of the Fermi energy, and you do that just by, you know, we'll assume that with a constant and plug that back into this, this equation here, but we're now we're going to write the density of states in, in this form so we can evaluate this constant in terms of the Fermi energy, and that allows us then to write the density of states uh, in this form, and we'll use this for other calculations, and it'll save you a lot of time trying to combine, you know, factors and powers and this sort of thing. So you still have the, the dependence, uh, it's just this factor turns out to be uh, in something that's uh, more manageable because we usually do, will do integrals up to the Fermi level. So anyway, we'll see how that works. So that was from last lecture. Oh yeah, and we should, for example, to find the mean energy then, we, we then multiply this density of states at t equals zero, it's the same factor. We, this occupancy is one up to the Fermi energy, so we don't have that factor there, we just have the basically number of state, the density of states times the energy, zero, we integrate to the Fermi energy, and if we plug in that form, we see this integral is, is very easy. I mean, you can, you can do it the other way, you'll just do a lot of algebra in the end to cancel out factors. And we see, we saw in the last lecture that the mean total energy is, well, the, the number of fermions times three-fifths the Fermi energy, and we showed a plot how that actually made sense. Now, what we really need, though, is to know what this mean energy is at some finite temperature. Um, so, I mean, to get the heat capacity, we need to know the dependence of energy on temperature, right? So we need the temperature dependence. And, and it turns out there's a, a, a systematic expansion in powers of the temperature divided by the Fermi temperature. It's called the Sommerfeld expansion. And for most, in, in many, many situations, this uh, is adequate uh, because you'll, this will this is like a power law expansion, and it, even taking the first term, you know, we're usually in the limit where the temperature is small compared to the Fermi temperature. So this expansion is very very useful, and in most situations, you only have to take the first uh, term. We'll see it's actually the square of the first non-zero term is um, th like this quantity squared. But before we do this, um, it, it's very good for us to look at some crude approximations. That was, we'll use some, some physical arguments to estimate the heat capacity and magnetic susceptibility. And uh, it'll be good to do this to get an idea of what's actually happening. And it'll turn out that these approximations really aren't that crude. So this is a very useful thing to do, and we'll, we'll go through that first. Okay, let's start with the approximate heat capacity at low temperatures. So to find the heat capacity, of course, we need an approximate expression for the temperature dependence of the mean energy here because the, the heat capacity uh, holding volume constant is, of course, this derivative, the derivative of the mean energy with respect to temperature. So we need this dependence um, at, even at small temperatures. Okay. Well, before we do that directly then, we can sort of make a crude approximation, and it's based upon the equipartition theorem. Uh, for a classical ideal gas. And if you're not familiar with the equipartition theorem, I actually included some supplementary, no supplementary note on it, um, which, which just works out the statistical mechanics for a classical system, uh, and, and it illustrates this idea. But the idea is very, very easy to state, right? 
the, the idea says that in the classical system, um, the energy, uh, the, the mean energy is kBT, sorry, that should be a capital B, kBT, one half kBT per available degree of freedom. What does that mean? Well, in, in a 3D, uh, in three dimensions, the gas, we have three degrees of freedom, and so we get three halves times the total number of, of particles uh, times kBT. That's what it means. Um, so if you had, for example, a harmonic oscillator or, or a whole bunch of oscillators, you would have actually um, two degrees of freedom. You would have you know, N times the number of oscillators times kBT classically. So it's in degrees of freedom, right? So particles that can move around in 3D have three independent degrees of freedom, and each one of them gets half the kBT. That's equipartition theorem for a classical system in a nutshell. And so if you have this then, which is linear in temperature, well, it's easy. That then the, the heat capacity is just 3 halves N times kB, right? So how do we apply this to our gas, ideal gas of fermions? Because we know that this might apply classically. We know classically means distinguishable particles. And, and the statistics are Maxwell Bolt, Boltzmann instead of Fermi Dirac and so on. Um, so we know that there should be a difference because we have this Fermi gas and, and we have these Fermi st statistics. So, but you know, we saw that only when we looked at the, the Fermi Dirac distribution function or even the, the density of states times the mean occupation, uh, uh, um, mean occupation number, we, we saw that, you know, that only particles near the Fermi energy are thermally excited to higher energy states. Go, go back and look at the last lecture for that. So this suggests to us that, you know, we can use this principle, but the available deg degrees of freedom are going to be much, much reduced. They're only going to include those amount of excited particles that are excited near the Fermi energy, near this Fermi sphere, if, as we called it last time. So this suggests only a small fraction of particles that are near this, around this, within KBT, we'll see, of this Fermi energy contribute to the specific heat. So that's the idea. So let's see what that, that gives us. Well, what's, what is this fraction? Well, here's our kind of crude approximation. Uh, of course, the density of states in 3D goes sort of like the square root of the energy, but let's just, for a moment, let's make a crude approximation. That the, the crude approximation is that the density of states is constant from zero up to the Fermi energy, and then it's zero. So so if I had, what kind of density of states would that be? Well, it would be the number of particles divided by the range of energy over which that is constant, which is the Fermi energy. So, so the density states, our rough approximation is density of states is, you know, N over the Fermi energy. And since the range over which therm fermions are thermally excited is of order KBT, we'd expect that the number of excited fermions, let's call it N sub E, to be total number, um, divided by the Fermi energy, which is a sort of, you know, kind of crude density of states, times, um, you know, th that's density per unit energy times the width kBT, or writing it in terms of temperatures, uh, we can write the Fermi energy as, as kBTF, then we'd expect the number of excited fermions to be much reduced from N and to be reduced by this factor of the temperature divided by the Fermi temperature. And temperature is always much smaller. We're, we're considering temperatures always much smaller than this, so this is a small fraction. And so then we apply this equipartition theorem, and we say, okay, well that means that, you know, the, the, the heat capacity, instead of 3 halves N times the Boltzmann's constant, it should be like the, the number of excited fermions, and we just plug that in, and we get this answer, right? Now, that's really interesting because uh, it turns out this, is, this crude argument will be off by a factor of pi squared over 3. Okay, so it's like off by a factor of 3. But what's more important is in the, if, in the usual, sorry, in the classically, the, uh, this partition function, you see it doesn't depend, on, it, the energy is linear with temperature, so uh, the heat capacity is just a constant. It's independent of temperature. And because of this, because now the number of excited fermions has this ratio T over TF, this depends like T, then um, of course the, then the heat capacity is going to have this linear temperature dependence here. 
And that actually is correct. The, the, a gas, an ideal gas of fermions do give you a linear dependence on the temperature. Uh, and this is actually the hallmark, the signature of an ideal Fermi gas. Okay. Well, there's another interesting property we can calculate with, and this will use absolutely the same idea. And this is the magnetic susceptibility. Well, if you remember, back in lecture four, we looked at paramagnetism for localized uh, atoms of spin J. Imagine our atoms set, sit at some lattice, and that means they're localized, and it also means they're distinguishable. So we didn't have to worry about quantum distribution functions for this. We just had to know the number, the, the states available for spin J. Anyway, we calculated this, and we found in the low field limit the so-called Curry law, which gave the susceptibility as some constant C over temp temperature, so inverse with temperature. And uh, the Curie constant, we, uh, we had an expression for arbitrary spin, but uh, we, we can plug in the value for spin 1 half in that formula back in lecture 4, and we find that the Curry constant, uh, and we'll also assume that G is 2, which it is to some number of decimal places, and uh, just for the purpose of, of, the, of simplification, and you, you can see that the Curry constant we derived for localized uh, spin J atoms was, uh, well, it was given by the number density, number per unit volume, times the Bohr magneton squared, uh, times the constant of uh, magnetic permeability constant, which basically came because the magnetic field is mu naught H, and the, magne uh, the susceptibility is uh, the derivative of magnetization with respect to H, so we'll We'll keep, we have the mu naught there, and divide by um, kV. And that's what we found for spin one half. And so, uh, of course, um, spin one half fermions such as the electrons, if we're, we'll, we're thinking now in terms of a, a metal with electrons that have spin one half, and because they have spin, of course, that well, there will be some magnetic susceptibility, but of course, they're indistinguishable and they obey Fermi statistics as we've been discussing. So it's not clear that we can completely take this formula or that formula would work. But we can use absolutely the same idea that we used for the heat capacity. Well, let's just suppose we replace this in. We can imagine that not all the number of spins can be flipped, you know, when we tickle the magnetic field because they're all sitting because we need um, we, we need some thermal excitations for um, to actually have a magnetic susceptibility if you well, well in, 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 well we can only um, we, we need to move electrons sorry we need to move, move fermions from below the Fermi surface to across the Fermi surface uh, that is um, in order to have some magnetic susceptibility Yeah, so, um, uh, so, but we'll use the same idea, of course, that we had before. And, and so, yeah, I guess what, what I was going to say is if you remember, um, for our localized spins, the susceptibility was actually zero both at low temperature and high temperature. Sorry, the, the, yeah, the, the susceptibility was zero at low temperature and extremely high temperatures because you can't really, um, magnet field doesn't have any effect on all the spins. Uh, there. So, so here we're in the low field limit, uh, but we're going to imagine that um, only uh, this number of excited electrons, that which we had we discussed in the last uh, slide in for heat capacity, is available, and that number is reduced by this factor T over Tf. And we'll do exactly the thing. We'll just plug in. Um, um, we'll replace this in by in the number of excited electrons. And of course, you can see what's going to happen then is that um, if we plug this into susceptibility, is the T's will cancel, uh, and we'll get the susceptibility in this case, uh, this form. Instead of having the the temperature here, um, that cancels this temperature here, and we have the Fermi temperature uh, downstairs in the in the denominator here. And and because of this cancellation, we'll see that. The susceptibility is kind of interesting for an ideal Fermi gas. This tells us or predicts that the um, 
susceptibility that is actually independent of temperature for the ideal Fermi gas, just by this same argument we used. And, um, and it turns out that that is actually that's true. That's what we'll find that at the low temp, the 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 susceptibility becomes constant. It's fairly constant at temperatures much less than the Fermi temperature, which are the temperatures we'll be interested in. And the actual number here, the actual value, turns out to be quite good. And we'll see from a direct calculation later in this lecture that we get absolutely the same thing. We just get a factor of three halves here instead of one. So just from these crude approximations, the point is we actually see that what really changes uh, things for this ideal Fermi gas is the Fermi statistics mean that there is actually this so-called Fermi sphere, this Fermi level, and at low temperatures, everything, at very low temperature and low energy, everything is filled, and it's only right around the Fermi surface that um, uh, particles are available to to either by thermal excitation or, or magnetic excitation. Okay, so if we really wanted to calculate, for example, the heat capacity, though, uh, we would have to know, um, we would have to know um, the energy as a function of uh, the temperature. And that's what we're going to, to, to discuss now. Now, we'll use what's called the Sommerfeld expansion. And uh, it's not on the syllabus for this course, but for those of you who are interested, I've included some supplementary notes that goes through this, um, develops the Summerfield expansion. I mean, it's really, it's really some math, uh, but it's very straightforward. It's just quite detailed, and, and, and um, if you want to look at them, fine. But we're just going to use the result. And so I'll show you what you get by using this, the result. So, what is the Sommerfeld expansion? Well, it's a systematic expansion that really relies on the properties of the, of the Fermi distribution function here. Uh, so, so that's the starting point. And, and so what the Sommerfeld expansion tells us is that, you know, there's a systematic expansion in the ratio T over Tf, which is usually small, and that for any function phi of epsilon, some, any function of energy, uh, that has a property that's zero at, at uh, zero energy, it tells us what the value of this integral of this function multiplied by um, the Fermi Dirac distribution. So, so this is what we're usually doing when we're, when we're finding something. We're going to be, inter like when we found the total number of particles, we integrated over the, uh, phi here was the density of states. And when we find the energy, this function would be epsilon times the g, the density of states. And so in general, as long as the, the Summerfield expansion is for any um, function here that, uh, that, that you want to integrate over the Fermi Dirac distribution. So we'll develop it as some arbitrary function and we'll use it for a specific uh, phi of epsilon. And what the Summerfield expansion tells us is that um, this kind of integral, the, the value of this integral, uh, looks like this. It has this first term where we just integrate from zero to the chemical potential of that function. And then the next term, which um, goes, is going to go like uh, kBT squared, um, will have this form. So it'll have this constant times kBT squared times the derivative with their epsilon, with, the derivative of this phi function with respect to energy epsilon evaluated at energy equal to the uh, chemical potential, and so forth, and we'll get different terms. And, and what you'll find is that the result of this and this derivative will give you um, a, a term that's uh, temperature divided by Fermi temperature squared, and then the next term will come out will be, will be proportional to temperature over Fermi temperature quantity to the fourth power. And, and since we're going to be very much interested in the limit when, when the temperature is much, much less than the Fermi energy, it's usually good enough just to take this one term. In fact, in most cases, it's good enough to use the zero temperature result as we showed with this, this crude estimate uh, that we did. But anyway, that's what Summerfield expansion tells us. So let's actually use this. So we want to find the mean energy at some non-zero temperature. And that means integrating from zero to infinity 
times the energy times the density of states times the occupancy here. And so that means, in, in terms of the notation here, this function phi is epsilon times the density of states. And if we use this form I said before for uh, density of states, that it's some constant times epsilon to the one half, and we, and we know what this constant is, uh, the calculation will be much, much easier. So, so that's the, this, so we're going to use Sommerfeld, and that's the function of interest here is epsilon times the density of states. And we're going to write the density of states in this, e this very useful form. Um, and, you can, and so we can also take the derivative of our phi function of this product here. And uh, I won't go through all the details, but uh, you'll see, well, you can, you can take the derivative here, but you can also see this answer is just 3 halves times um, um, the density of states. So it's kind of interesting property there, right? Okay, so now we have we understand what uh, we need to plug into this Sommerfeld expansion. We do that, and we we have this for the mean energy. Um, we have these now these two terms. We're only taking the first term um, in the Sommerfeld expansion, and we'll see that that's all we need because the the next term in the Sommerfeld expansion would give us once we evaluate things uh, a term that's like T over Fermi temperature to the quantity four. And we're going to be really interested in T much, much less than the Fermi energy. So, so we have, now we have this formula. Um, let's just go to the next page here. I've written it again. And we look at this and we see, well, one, this integral goes from zero to the Fermi temperature, sorry, to the uh, chemical potential. And this is actually the chemical potential at non-zero temperature, which we, we haven't done yet. And this is also evaluated in principle at the uh, chemical potential at, at non-zero temperature. But, um, and, and we'll, we'll, um, so what you do with this, how you get the Sommerfeld expansion to work is the first thing you calculate is the temperature dependence of the chemical potential. And you'll see that in my, the supplementary notes. And we'll see what it is. Actually, if we look ahead, uh, it's, it's just this. Um, so it's, it's the Fermi energy minus some, some small contribution that goes like, um, you know, also like uh, T squared over Fermi temperature or T over Fermi temperature. But the point is uh, we're going to be interested in this limit of temperatures much, much less than the Fermi energy. So think of a metal where we're at room temperature 300 Kelvin and the Fermi temperature is, you know, like... 30,000 at least Kelvin, um, so that's, you know, 10 to the minus, what's that, uh, 30,000 and 300 is, is a factor of 300, uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's less than a percent, and so T squared over T Fermi squared is going to be, you know, 10 to the minus 5 or 6. Anyway, we're going to be interested in this limit, so we expect the deviation of mu from the Fermi uh, energy, which is this quantity, to be very, very small. Um, and so then if we look at this first term, we'll see what we can, we can uh, if this deviation is small, we can break this integral up into the integral from zero to, to the zero temperature uh, for uh, chemical potential. Oh, I need to make that epsilon, the notation there is, I need to fix. But uh, we, we integrate from zero to the Fermi energy, and then the other piece of the integral would, would be from mu to, uh, for, from the value of the chemical potential at finite temperature fr from the Fermi energy there, we'll just take, you know, since it's small, we'll just take basically d epsilon to be this value, and we'll multiply it by the Fermi energy and by the density of states of the Fermi energy. And this is true if this is really, really small. So that's how we've handled this first term. And now let's look at the second term. And we, and we also know what this term is. That's what we worked out before at zero temperature. It's just three-fifths total number of particles times the Fermi energy. Okay, um, now let's look at the second term. We can simplify this term by taking uh, the chemical potential to be that at zero temperature, which is the Fermi energy. And to show that, one needs to take the higher order results for the chemical potential. And if you plug that in and evaluate this at that, you'll see you get even higher order terms. And so that tells you that you only need to evaluate this derivative at the Fermi energy, the, the chemical potential equal to the Fermi energy. Um, I'm not going to do that here, but you can you can show that. And so what we're left with then is um, 
these three terms, right? The, the mean energy at zero temperature and these two other terms that correct that. And of course now we know what the density of states are and we just evaluate the density of states at the Fermi level. Here we have to plug in the temperature dependence of, of the um, chemical potential, but and, and that's you can work out for the with the Sommerfeld expansion. And and here's the answer you'll see in my moat. So that so so you see that the chemical potential gets shifted by uh, uh, this small amount. And if we plug this in here and th th these two things in this equation and collect terms, we'll see we get this rather simple re result that the mean energy is the mean energy at zero temperature plus this correction factor. And this correction factor is proportional to the temperature, but it goes like T over uh, Tf. And um, if we um, if we take out, let's just write this in another way. We'll take out the three halves in times the Fermi energy out of both quantities, and we'll get it in this form. So this form tells us uh, the shift, the the fractional shift in the mean energy. So basically. At finite temperature, the mean energy is 1 plus this small factor. And you see that small factor now goes like T over Fermi temperature quantity squares. And, and this is very, very small for the usual situation. So you can see this is a very, very small correction. And, and then we can just read off, of course, the, the um, heat capacity, which is the derivative of this with respect to temperature. It only selects that term. And it gets simplified, we see it's pi squared over 2 uh, n kb times t over tf. So we see the linear, linear dependence of the heat capacity, as we saw before. And so uh, as, we, as we said with our crude estimate, we can think of this sort of number as the number of excited fermions. Uh, so it's, it's, it's the total number reduced by this factor. And the only difference we had between now and our crude argument is this factor of pi squared over two, right? Which is, which is what, like five, okay, say? So our crude argument was pretty good. It got the temperature dependence correct, uh, and, and it was just off by a factor of five, a uh, small factor. So it's, it was right to an or, less than an order of magnitude. Okay. And by the way, you might be curious and I did this once just because I was curious, so uh, um, it took some time, but I actually calculated the mean energy to the second order, and second order you'll see with the Sommerfeld expansion gives you a correction uh, that's T over Tf to the fourth power. In fact, the Sommerfeld expansion only has even powers, so you can see that even when this quantity is sm it's small, you know, the square is even smaller, so um, you know, being in the limit of, of temperature less than the Fermi temperature, at most you'll only need this term, and most of the time you can you can use the zero temperature result. Um, okay. Well, now let's do a calculation with what we've learned, um, and we'll actually calculate what we we estimated crudely before, which is the susceptibility of uh, free electrons, Fermi gas of free electrons. And this one we won't actually need the Sommerfeld expansion. Uh, we could have calculated this. So, so this you can just calculate uh, at zero temperature. Uh, remember, we, we, we kind of, it's kind of funny because we use the argument of number excited spins at finite temperature to get a crude estimate, but we'll, um, we'll show that you can calculate this um, just uh, at zero temperature, but the point is we'll calculate it when this energy, this magnetic energy scale is much, much smaller than the Fermi temperature. That's what allows us to calculate the, the, the susceptibility here. Okay, so this is, we've got to change gears a little bit because now we're going to have um, uh, electrons uh, with a spin-dependent energy. So electrons with spin up will have uh, epsilon minus the um, B times the Bohr magneton. This is a spin one half, by the way. And um, electrons with spin 
down will have epsilon plus mu b times the magnetic field b. Yeah, so magnetic parallel and antiparallel to uh, B gets minus and plus sign. And so I'm going to do this calculation where I kind of doing, I'm sort of trying to kill two birds with the same stone. I'm going to keep my plus and minus through the, all the calculation. Uh, and if you get confused, then you should work it out with one sign and then work it out with the other sign. But um, once you do it a couple times, you realize you can, you can, you can do this at the same time. Okay, so here's, here's how it works. So the total number of electrons of magnetic, mo magnetic moment parallel, that's spin up or arrow pointing up here, or anti-parallel is basically um, one half uh, times this integral. So the density, and, th and this is the one half becomes up, because remember I included in my density of states the factor of two for spin. So I'm just getting, uh, taking that back out, but I'll keep the definition with two here, or with both spins included in my density of states. And so uh, basically I have the same thing as I had for total number. I'm just going to do the number of spin up and the number of spin down. And um, it's just the density of states times the occupancy. But now the occupancy depends, of course, on the energy, which is uh, different for spin up and spin down. And of course, remember we have we still use the Fermi Dirac distribution. It's just we plug in the energy um, and explicitly write the um, the spin dependent energy here inside. So remember, definition of magnetization uh, of a system in volume is basically the number of of spin up minus the number of spin down times the Bohr magneton divided by the volume. Or spin one half. Okay. So at t equals zero, then it, it, it's pretty this, the same thing we have for this uh, this uh, Fermi Dirac distribution. If we include spin, it's the same thing. It's one if this are if if the argument of of this is less than the Fermi energy, and zero if it's greater than the Fermi energy. No different than before. Well, maybe I shouldn't say no different as before. It, of course, it's the same distribution function. Uh, the only thing that's different is that the argument depends upon being spin up or spin down uh, with a minus or plus sign in the energy that goes in the argument. So in the end, though, we, we just calculate the numbers much like we did when we actually uh, um, found the constraint on chemical that for chemical potential. That is, we just calculate the number spin up and the number spin down, take their difference, multiply by this. So. Uh, of course, we need to, these, in, these will involve integrals um, over the density of states. The only thing we need to be careful about is the, the, the uh, limits of integration. So, so we're going to be integrating over epsilon. Let's look at spin up. Spin up, this would be, uh, we need to integrate where this is 1, and that's 1 with epsilon up to the Fermi energy plus mu b b. That is, we, we, we're integrating over epsilon, so we, we need to solve for the limit of integration um, and uh, we need to solve this, we limit, we integrate epsilon up to, we move this to the other side, Fermi energy plus for the minus sign here, and, and, and then of course minus for the other sign. So that's why um, the signs here are flipped, it's just taking a proper account of the limit of integration. And this is very easy to do, right? We, we did this calculation before, and we just got uh, the Fermi energy here. Um, and, um, and we solved the Fermi energy here. But now we know what the Fermi energy is from before. Uh, we just, we can actually evaluate n plus and n minus by, and, and, and this is the value we get. So for spin up, it's plus sign, spin down, it's a minus sign, and we just subtract the two. Um, and, uh, and, and so in, in principle, we could do that with this answer, but uh, there's one other thing. If we look at, at this uh, quantity here to the 3 half power, Mm. We'll get, we can see that uh, this term is much, much smaller than this term, essentially. So, so if we plug in the numbers, for example, we see that the Bohr magneton is 5.8 times 10 to the minus 5 EV per Tesla, right? That's energy per Tesla. Uh, 
And it, as we argued for metals, this that which we're interested in this, the Fermi energy is a few electron volts. So, so you know, even when B is a Tesla, this is this is you know the the, the energy, the spin energy in the magnetic field is much, much less than the Fermi energy, even up to, you know, large uh, magnetic fields. So, I mean, you know, you I guess the largest magnet you can easily buy and put a lab is not more than 20 Tesla. In a high field mag lab, they might maybe 100 Tesla, but in any case, this energy in a metal is always going to be, you're always going to be in this limit. And so, even though we could work with this, uh, let's, we, we for the purposes of illustration and or in this limit that we're usually interested in. Well, let's just expand this. Let's exp do a Taylor series expansion above that, you know. Let's pull out the, so let's pull, to make it easier, let's pull out this uh, Fermi energy to three half power, which is what we had for a zero magnetic field. And then we expand this term and take the first term in the expansion, the power law expansion of that, and we see we get this. And so then if we do the subtraction um, uh, and, and, and we are at t equals zero here, by the way. Uh, we see this is what we get um, in that limit. And um, so um, we just plug that in the magnetization, and we see here we, we have three halves, n over v, um, and the quantities here, uh, and n times h. And when we take the derivative to find the susceptibility, we just get this, of course. and and you recognize, if you go back to our crude approximation, this is exactly what we found. Um, the only um, difference is a factor of three halves here. So, so our crude approximation was, was fairly correct. Main thing is it's independent of temperature. So that one we really didn't need the Sommerfeld expansion. We, we used basically the t equals zero result, um, and but we we use the property to get this particular answer, we use this property here and expanded that. Okay. Well, that's nice to see that we can do that. Um, so this is another interesting property of the ideal Fermi gas, and, and particularly the um, common application of that is to, to understand uh, free electrons in metals. Okay, well, the last part of this um, of this lecture will be to calculate the pressure of a Fermi gas, and what we'll find here is that uh, the pressure of a Fermi gas is actually really very high. Actually, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the, the actually the equation of state. Um, you know, if you remember the equation of state for an ideal gas, PV equals uh, nRT, or you know, its PV is proportional to the energy mean energy. Uh, we're going to do that here. But just uh, before we do that, we'll just go through a little review of some, some thermodynamics. I'm, I'm sure you've had this earlier in the course and, and you've probably worked it out in tutorial, but um, let's just you know, go through it one more time. Um, if we look at the, gr the grand potential uh, that we introduced uh, as minus uh, kT or kB, um, here I've dropped my B for simplicity, Boltzmann's constant times temperature, um, times log of the grand sum. Um, and that's the definition of it. We, we can also see that uh, from thermodynamics that it's sort of the Legendre transformation of the Helmholtz free energy F, where we eliminate um, N in favor of the, of, of the chemical potential, which is the derivative of the free energy with respect to number. And this you've probably seen earlier in the course. Uh, this is the Legendre transformation. Um, and so if we look at the differentials of the grand potential uh, with respect to volume, temperature, and mu, you'll see that uh, uh, we get uh, definitions of pressure, entropy, and number, of course, in terms of partial derivatives of the grand sum, uh, sorry, the grand potential uh, with respect, uh, holding uh, you know, various things constant like mu and t here. So for, you've had this in the first part of the course. The important thing for uh, this discussion is that the pressure is defined as the negative partial derivative of the grand sum or the sort of grand potential with respect to volume uh, holding mu and temperature constant. Now, you might have also um, um, 
seen this before with thermodynamics, but this grand potential is, of course, an extensive quantity. Um, and in this context, uh, where it depends upon mu and volume and temperature, extensive means that for some constant lambda, let's say, that the, uh, the grand potential as a function of mu and lambda times volume and temperature is lambda times the grand potential of mu volume and temperature. Right? So this just tells you, uh, you know, that um, um, how the, the grand potential scales with volume. And according to Euler's theorem, uh, it says, you know, the property is a homogeneous function of degree one, which is this function here. Um, basically, tell, you know, it, it tells you that the form of this um, is, is volume times this derivative, um, which is actually uh, um, pressure, right? So, so you have this, the important thing is this relation between grand potential and um, PV. And of course, this is, in this case, uh, you know, Euler's theorem is quite easy to see. Let's just, you know, if we, do, if we differentiate this with respect to lambda uh, and just plug in, basically this is lambda times this, uh, and you, you take the derivative of this, of course, you get two terms, and, and uh, since this doesn't depend on lambda, that gives, you get one term is zero, and you multiply the derivative of lambda of d lambda, which is one, and you get this, right? And so if we multiply, you know, basically, um, if we were to multiply by the volume and take the derivative with respect to this, we would get um, um, the grand, grand potential over here, and if we set lambda equal one, which we can do, well, then we'll, we'll have this relationship, which is basically, um, uh, this is P and this is minus V here, as we saw back here. So it's really, it's quite easy to see. I mean, it sounds rather fancy with uh, Euler's theorem, but, uh, you know, um, that's how it goes. Uh, and in, again, it's very fancy. It's really simple. If, if you knew that um, um, the grand potential was proportional to volume, you know, it's x times some volume, and of course x has to be this factor, right? So, so this is a very fancy way to, to show this, uh, an extensive quantity, um, yeah, just as an aside, but um, it kind of has to be that. Here, the main thing is that we have this relationship here, and and that's and that's a general relationship, no matter you know what system we're. The point is, it, it doesn't matter. This is not classical or quantum or anything. This is just purely by definition in thermodynamics, and so um, you know we can now evaluate the grand potential. Um, for our Fermi gas, and we actually will get essentially the equation of state, and that equation of state we can work out and allow us to calculate the pressure. So, yeah, let's just do that. Let's find the uh, grand potential for the Fermi gas that we've been discussing, the ideal Fermi gas. Uh, we know the relationship to the grand sum, and we know what the grand sum is, what we showed, and um, and um, here. Um, um, here the summation is over energies uh, I. I think I used R before, but uh, the point is we're going to this continuum limit where we, we go from the sum to the integral. And we do this, of course, um, um, and we put in the density of states this uh, in this really easy kind of form that we evaluated before. And of course, we want to integrate the logarithm of that, and that's you know not so straightforward, but you realize you can integrate by parts. I won't go through the details here because you should know integration by parts, but if you need some uh, refresher on it, I've, I've written it out explicitly so you can see, you know, the point with integration by parts is you find, you break your integral in some piece that you can, uh, you know, you can um, integrate and some piece that you can differentiate and, and easily and, and that allows you to do that. And I'm not going to go through that because, you know, but th just to be explicit, uh, the main thing is you can actually find, um, we're just going to divide by KBT here, we're going to find this um, in terms of uh, uh, this integral, which we now have done, uh, 
And of course, we plug in that value for A that we had. But even if we just look at this, in the end, we find that the grand potential is, um, you know, minus two thirds A times this this integral here. And this integral is uh, epsilon to the three halves times the times the Fermi Dactyl distribution of the mean occupation number. And uh, oh, gee, that looks like something we had before, right? Because the density of states goes like epsilon to the one half, and if we're finding the mean energy, we multiply by epsilon, then we get epsilon to the three half. So this is basically telling us that essentially, well, remember the mean energy is this integral. Um, I've written the density of states in this rather simple, convenient form, because we know in the end, we know what A is. We don't even have to evaluate it here, but you see we get this power. And so you see right away that uh, we've worked out the equation of state for the Fermi gas. Basically, PV equals two-thirds, um, sorry, U, I should have E here. Um, I, 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 I realized it earlier I used the, uh, I will change that in the lecture. This should be E. Um, um, that's, the, that's the equation of state. And so, um, so if we look at this for t equals zero, um, we can actually solve this because uh, we, we've actually calculated the mean energy and everything. Uh, remember, the mean energy was three fifths the Fermi energy. And so we plug that all in and we get this relation for the pressure. It only depends upon the Fermi energy and the density, the number density um, of our electrons. And so you ask yourself, what is the typical value of that for a typical metal? Well, for silver, it turns out the Fermi temperature is about 65,000 Kelvin, and the density is about 6 times 10 to the 28 per cubic meter. And if I plug in Boltzmann's constant, uh, I get a pressure of 21 gigapascals. And you, you know, think about that number, and... Uh, you say, wow, that is actually huge because it's like 10 to the 5, the kind of pressure of your car tire, which is you know about two atmospheres, basically, roughly. So that's a huge, huge pressure. Um, and that also is a property of the ideal Fermi gas because of this large, um, this Fermi energy, right? So we'll see the consequences of... Uh, pressure of a Fermi gas. Next week, when we just, we will um, study the stability of another uh, ideal Fermi gas, and that's uh, the electrons um, inside a, um, a so-called white dwarf star. But with this big a pressure, just one thing you can think about before next week, then if they have such a high pressure, what keeps those electrons in the solid? So, um, I'll, uh, I'll correct the notation here a bit before I uh, upload a new version of the notes, but I'm going to end the lecture now. And um, we'll pick back up uh, next week uh, with another um, well-known and interesting ideal Fermi gas, uh, that is uh, so-called white dwarf stars. Okay, see you next time.